Welcome to the Leadership for Society seminar series, People in Planet and Information Era. And today I have Eric Schmidt. Thank you for joining us. And Eric is the chair of the Special Competitive Studies Project, former CEO and chairman of Google. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Brian. I'll do anything I can do to help Stanford and what you're trying to do. It's a great program. Really appreciate it. So let me start by asking you a little bit about your experience at Google. So over the time you were there, what would you say is the biggest change you noted in the industry? Well, there's been a lot of changes, but, but one way to understand it is that we were successful because of the scale of the internet and the scale of computing network scale. And we were able to build algorithms that scaled to billions of people. I noted with alarm, with alarm that Gmail had four billion users. <laughs> That's half the planet. I'm really proud of that. I remember the day we introduced it. Never would I have thought that that could have occurred. What I've learned in tech is when you get something that works and can scale, it can explode, and that's fantastic. Really exciting. So one of the features of tech that's gotten a lot of attention is the monetization of personal data. So I'm wondering what you think is the cost and benefits of that model of monetizing the scale that you de described. Well, a lot of people talk about this, but they don't speak about it accurately. Mm -hmm. So the first question that I would offer is, if you have a free service, somebody's got to pay for it. Now, you can have philanthropists, you can have the government, you can have advertisers or what have you. At Google, we were extremely careful not to use your personal data to sell it. There are other places, some social media, for example, some other search engines try this. It doesn't typically work. People value their privacy. So you've got to find a way to find affinities, you know, this group and that group, without violating people's personal lives, their location, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So the way I understand it, so I, correct me if I'm wrong, is that once people are providing this information, what they're searching for, or on social media, what they look at, it's a way of identifying their interests to keep them engaged. And so how should we think about the cost of really focusing on trying to keep people's attention. So this, as, as it's gone on, especially in social media, I would say probably more than search, that's become a concern that we are finding ways to just keep people engaged. And some of the ways that we pe keep people engaged are not the most positive. Well, 20 years ago, we fought this question about personal information and search. And we ultimately compromised in the sense that the regulators required a certain amount of retention of information about your searches. So for example, if you were a bad person, they could get a subpoena and that sort of thing. But in general, your searches are forgotten after a while, which is a good compromise. Mm -hmm. In social media, you have a different problem that I don't think we understood when social media came out 10 years ago. What happens now is that the AI algorithms are so good that they can find people just like you and connect you. Mm -hmm. Now these are not people that you would meet in normal life. They're not, they, they don't live near you, they don't go to Stanford, they didn't go to the same college, you don't know them, they're not friends, and so forth. And it creates these affinity groups which connect, for example, horrific people together, mm. right? Who then organize to take over the government illegally, right? So, so we, the good news is we're finding affinity groups, mm. but unfortunately, those who ignore human nature ignore the fact that there are badly motivated people, immoral people, and people who are willing to do harm to others. And so the problem with social media is it's both doing amazing work, collecting people who, all the standard stories of people who are suffering from some disease, and building communities, entertainment communities, childcare communities, all of that's all true, but it's also having this effect as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to think about the responsibility that companies should have for that. And I actually am gonna pivot a little bit, not just and talk about the data we have of people and the ability to create these affinity groups as you described, but uh, a large percentage of people get their news from social media now. So according to a Pew study in 2021, about half of Americans get news on social media at least sometimes. So when you think about that plus the affinity groups, the possibility of putting together bad people, what responsibility should organizations like you know, social media companies have for the potential harm they can do to society. Well, to some degree, the social, social media companies have been in denial on this, and I'm glad that this discussion is underway. So let's start with some principles. I was brought up to believe in the legitimate institutions of government and the media. In my case, I grew up with two television channels, and there were only two, and you were told to believe them. 
Today, there's a lot of evidence that people prefer to trust their friends over institutions. And they've chosen to define their friends as the people that they are friends online with. And that is the basis of the current problem. So in other words, if you fundamentally, for whatever reason, have been taught or believe or correctly believe or incorrectly believe that the government and the legitimate institutions of the news are tr out to get you, you can't trust them, mainstream media, what have you, without a critical eye, you just agree with that, then you trust people like you. Then the algorithm finds people like you, right? Think of it as weaponizing you. They find you and they recruit you. So let's think about a crazy person. And uh, my standard joke on this is they all seem to be on some strange farm in Oregon. You know, I don't know if I, every when I've looked at it, <laughs> which is unfair to Oregon, by the way. So you've got some crazy person in a farm in Oregon who spews out complete crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. It's completely false. Well, with President Trump, it was one stop from that crazy person to President Trump retweeting that crazy person's thing and legitimizing it. So he should be held responsible, in my view, for spreading misinformation that he should have known better. That's my personal view. But now, what really happened was actually slightly different. This crazy person would tweet something. I'm using tweet, but Facebook, uh, I'm just using it as a metaphor. They would publish this information, and it would sit around, and then it would go viral in the sense that the algorithm would discover that it was interesting, and the algorithm would boost it. Mm. So one way to say it is, a different way of asking this is say, Eric, what do you believe in terms of speech? I am absolutely committed to free speech by adults. And th I define that as you get to say what you uh, say, even if I disagree with it, and I have to at least acknowledge you have the right to say it. I do not believe in boosting of said speech without liability. So the problem is that the platforms are, are also responsible for the spread of the misinformation. Many of them have been in denial on this, but the fact of the matter is their algorithms are so good mm. that they find something, and we know, for example, that emotional content is spread seven times faster than reason content. Let me say it emotionally. I want my country back. I thought my country was a country of reasoned discourse, good arguments, strong principles, fights around uh, greatness. And instead, it's turned into crazy person, rumor, falsehood, misinformation. I want to go back to the earlier model. So the earlier model, there? yes, now that's the, that's the question. How do, How we, do get we get there? there? So would you, you talked about liability. Would you, do you think that the company should be liable for this? Do you think the company should, um, for the January 6th um, event, should they be held liable? Like where, where is responsibility? So this is a really hard problem. And the reason is that if you start thinking about it, and I've thought about it a lot, all of the roads end up to something which is completely unacceptable which is the Department of Internet Regulation. It's not going to work. So we need sensible changes in social media. Let me give you some examples. We allow people legally age 13 and up. It should really be 16 and up because we protect minors in society, but we don't protect them from social media, which is where all the terrible stuff, in my view, is, as well as good stuff. We need to make that change. Another thing is that we need to know how these algorithms work. And not to scare you, but it's going to get much, much worse. And the reason it's going to get much worse is that the AI algorithms are getting so good. And I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a well-known figure. Um, I, I hope I'm a good person. You can decide for yourself. Someone who doesn't like me or for whatever reason takes my likeness and turns me into a racist, sexist bigot and has my voice. And people will believe that I said that, and it's repugnant to me. What right do I have? We don't have an answer to that. We have to have some rules or way for me to get that under control because it's a use of my likeness. It's worse in commercial speech. If it's interesting that in social media, most of the revenue comes from advertisers, and advertisers are intelligent, and they don't want to be, ad uh, to be adjacent to this kind of hatred. Mm -hmm. So one way to say it, would to say that when you have a, a, a feed 
that is supported by advertising, you have a commercial responsibility to the advertisers and that they can push back on the platforms. Mm -hmm. These are examples. If you know who's on the platform, another thing we don't know, using various forms of ID verification, both for age but also are they. And by the way, I'm not suggesting the end of anonymity. Um, I think anonymity is very important. Do we still have anonymity? Well, we do in the following sense. Um, when you get on an Uber driver, when you get into an Uber or, or Lyft or what have you, do you personally know the driver? Have you met the driver before? Typically not. Mm -hmm. In fact, I seldom know the, the real name of the driver, but I trust that that driver, man or woman, has been uh, validated, secured, investigated, what have you, that it's a trustworthy momentary interaction. I think that we could build algorithms in social media which allow you to have the anonymity, which I think is important for privacy and for the ability for speech and to say what you think, especially in cases where you've been victimized, mm -hmm. but also having the system underneath know who you are. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, I think we should have a rule that, there's a, that you have to declare when, when it's a bot as opposed to a human, because I'm in favor of, remember, free speech of humans and not bots. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that we have to do is we have to have a marker, technically a watermark, on where did the content come from. If you know that it's a real human, if you know how the algorithm works, and you know that the content is genuine, it was not synthesized, then you have an approximation for truth, mm -hmm. right? Because then the platform can say, this is a human, this is what they said, this is what they generated. And this other stuff, we're not so sure. It's entertaining, it's interesting. Uh, the one that shocked me, so I'm clear, I was very good friends and on the board of Apple with Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. There is an interview with a, a site called podcast.ai that just came out, which is an interview today with Joe Rogan interviewing Steve Jobs on the Matters Today in his voice. Mm. Now, I love Steve Jobs, and I miss him terribly. It sent shivers down my spine. That's what we're confronting. And I can tell you from my many years at Google doing things involving YouTube and so forth and so on, people react. They react emotionally. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It can lead to crowds and assaults and harm. Mm -hmm. We've got to get a sensible structure. And I propose knowing who the people are, knowing where the content front came from, appropriate age li limitations, and understanding how the algorithms are. I think those are sensible, mm -hmm. and they don't require regulating speech, which we're not in favor of. Yeah, so I'm wondering about the anonymity that you're describing. So I think, if I understand correctly, the anonymity you're describing is when I say something, the people who I'm saying it to might not know who I am, but because they trust the platform, because the safeguards you have that you're describing are in place, it's known somewhere I am, there's a verification that I am a person. That you're saying, a human, human being. being saying that thing. you're a human. But I think today, and I'll speak for myself a bit, the anonymity I worry about is the corporations in knowing who I am, mm -hmm. right? Because of the way that data is collected, the way that data has been used, the fear of breaches of that data. So in, in, that, in your scenario, are you asking people to trust the organizations? I think you, I, I'm sorry to be blunt, Brian, I think you lost that battle. <laughs> The fact of the matter is the corporations, in order for these algorithms to work, they know a great deal of information. Mm -hmm. It is crucial that those corporations keep that information proprietary. We know technically how to do that. Um, and if a corporation were to violate your trust in the way that you're describing, there should be penalties, uh, financial penalties. You should leave the platform. There should be regulatory penalties. When I was running Google, I always worried that there would be some data breach, thank God there never was, mm -hmm. that would harm people in the way you're describing. Sensible leadership understands the point you're making and they can put the protections in place. And what role does government have in this? So the way, you, I mean, thus far we're talking about it as the organizations should put these safeguards in place. They have the technical ability to do it. But it seems like every other day there's a breach, yeah. right? And, and yeah. so I wonder how much faith we should put in organizations and where is the role of government in the, what you're describing? I'll now show you my own prejudices. Um, when you look at the really top technical companies, the, the really well-run ones, which include Google and its competitors and so forth, you don't have those breaches. The cost to them is too high, and their engineers are really good. The breaches that you're describing are from systems that were built a long time ago in technologies that aren't very good. They're running down-rev platforms, and you have to assume 
Um, you see this in the government all the day. Most of the government systems, you have to assume, have been breached because the government is quite incompetent at building powerful new platforms. They're just not good at it. And unfortunately, you, the, in, I'm sorry to say this, I think your primary danger is your government information getting leaked through some sort of Chinese or adversarial attack, which is obviously not okay, and the liability is high. Um, I've been involved in a number of, of an analyses of these breaches, um, and when you have a, a leadership which is sort of asleep at the wheel, they grow up really fast when this happens, and they do, in fact, put the safeguards in place. Mm -hmm. And so what should the relationship then be between government and these kind of private tech companies? Well, <clears throat> it's easy to complain about the private tech companies. Mm -hmm. And um, let's break them up. They're too big. They have too much power. But they're, as a general rule, honest, well-run, and they do what they say. And the reason that they're honest and well-run and do what they say is if they don't, they get sued to death. The board of directors get sued. The, the CEOs get sued. So if you propose regulation, then do so in a way in the spirit of making it better. There's no question that there's content that is bad, mm -hmm. harmful. Try to write down the rules. I've tried to do this. Mm -hmm. So let's say we, I don't like this kind of thing and this kind of thing and this kind of thing, and I write it down. Okay, now this is a democracy. Do we all agree? By the way, the great news is we all agree against child porn. Mm -hmm. We all agree. There's no, no one I know of in favor of it. But write it about adult porn, you won't get agreement. Write it about drugs or alcohol or other controversial things. One of the things to understand, and I'll say this in a historical context, is that we all complain about freedom of speech. But the fact of the matter is freedom of speech is at the essence of how America works. Mm -hmm. And the complicated trade-offs, I, I was not aware of all the restrictions on speech. It turns out that you can say some things, but there's plenty of things you can't say. Right? You can't threaten people. You can't threaten to kill them. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of issues around defamation and so forth and so on. Uh, I think those vehicles are there. I, I forgot one more thing to add. The industry d uh, runs on something called the DMCA. And the DMCA was done, I think, in 1994. I was there when this was all happening. And it basically exempts the platform from liability. There is a lawsuit, which curiously involves Google. It's in front of the Supreme Court, where there is a possibility that the DMCA exemption will be narrowed. Mm. If that occurs, and no one knows what the Supreme Court is going to do, of course, that could usher in a, a reason to modify that law right, in some way. And that will be a great opportunity to have this debate of where this liability is. I want to be truthful and say there's clearly a speaker, but, there's, but the publisher, in this case the, the service, the online system, has some culpability in spreading it. You just have to decide what the penalty for bad culpability is. The DMCA says you can do what you want as long as you use the DMCA protection. That's going to get questioned. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm looking forward to those conversations. But I know you're also a, um, a proponent of private public or private government cooperation. So what, what does that look like? What, what, is, what kind of relationship do you, what kind of relationships do you like? Well, one of the things that I, I learned, you know, as a technical person, you don't have time to study history, so I guess you learn it later, is that there's a really long history in America of the three branches that I care about, which are not the government side. It's universities, the private sector, and the government. The universities produce here at Stanford extraordinary achievements. I mean, look at what has been achieved in America. The engine of the world, all of the top universities started off here. I, I can go on and on and on about the greatness of America. Look at the business side, venture capital, the extraordinary creations that have occurred, which I've benefited from. Mm -hmm. And look at good regulation from the government. As an example, let's look at Operation Warp Speed. Mm -hmm. Under a Republican president, Operation Warp Speed, because of the emergency of the situation of COVID, guaranteed the product to buy the product of companies that took huge risks, not knowing if the product was going to work. That's a case where the scientists work together with the business world and the, and the government to respond to a critical thing. We know how to do this. We claim that we're all capitalists. We claim that we're all whatever we are. But the fact of the matter is, it's intertwined. I was, as a graduate student on an NSF and DARPA grant, 
I'm eternally grateful for the government to give me the money to learn the things that I needed to do to become successful as, as I have been. Mm -hmm. I needed the government to give me that money. That was the only way, place to get it. Thank God they did it. And by the way, it wasn't a lot. It was like $15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. It was a good deal <laughs> for the U.S. compared to the taxes that we pay now. Mm -hmm. You see my point. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at it with a more enlightened model, right, it's getting that cycle without the rhetoric working well. Another example um, more recently is the challenge from China. And if you look at the CHIPS Act, technically USICA, on a bipartisan basis, we were able to get $250 billion, a huge amount of money over five or 10 years, depending on which part of it you look at, allocated to the advancement of competitiveness against China in key national security areas. Now, the Republicans did it for national security reasons. The Democrats did it for national security reasons and other reasons. The universities are doing it because they want the money. Mm -hmm. All right, the businesses really need the money because they want to compete with China in something as important as semiconductors, which are the most complicated things that are built on the planet. Mm -hmm. So that's a, another good example. And it took two years of negotiation. It's a democracy. It's a mess and mm -hmm. so forth. And I'm very proud to have played a very small role in making that happen. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about national security, but I, before I get there, I'm curious, why don't you think people understand the role that government plays in the innovation of this country? So it's as if it's all private industry, and what you're talking about, and I think people don't fully appreciate often, is how big a role the government plays in allowing things like Google to take place because of the infrastructure that's built, the support that it provides well, for the new ideas. But let's think about it. Did you come here by some form of GPS map navigation? Right? Thank God the Air Force in the 90s launched those satellites, and thank God the government actually allowed those satellites to be used in an accurate way. Initially it wasn't. Remember, they were, it was randomized. Mm -hmm. And that al enabled the sensors which are on phones, which ultimately enabled these enormous uh, geo-based apps. Mm -hmm. Now, how long did that take? 30 years. What was the origin of Google? Right? Larry and Sergey founded it. Well, actually, there's a story before that. There was an NSF grant in the mid-90s that, that thought about building an index. And the money, by the way, came to Stanford mm -hmm. and a number of other places. Um, think about self-driving cars, right? which I'm still waiting for, by the way. <laughs> uh, the, the, the DARPA Grand Challenge. Mm -hmm. right? I was part of a challenge. And we, we had meetings in 2004, 2005 here at Stanford mm -hmm. right? in order to do that. So, so the facts are that Vannevar Bush, who was a hero of war, wartime, when, when World War II ended, he took all of this wartime money, I guess I'll, I don't exactly understand how it worked, but he had all this excess money, and he used it to fund basic science. We are here today in this gorgeous place with all of this technology because of a single guy who said, I'm just taking the money and giving it to basic research. We'll see what happens. That's the courage of these leaders. Now, he, of course, is dead, but he's a true hero. We need to acknowledge that our predecessors took the political and financial risks to create the environment. When you walk around the Stanford campus, you see all these buildings. They have names on it of dead people. Those dead people gave the money, okay? Mm -hmm. You should be thankful. Mm -hmm. you, should, you, should, you should say, oh my God, I'm so happy that way back when they had enough money that they had the foresight to make this comfy place for me to do these amazing things. Mm -hmm. We need to acknowledge the history. Mm -hmm. And do you think the government should play a bigger role? Should it be more prominent? I, I, I worry about um, the decay of the vibrancy of the democracy. And one potential issue is that people don't appreciate the role that government plays in making their life as great as it is. So I, I also appreciate that private industry has a significant role to play. And obviously, universities have, have a role to play. But I, th I, I worry that the role of government is lost or underappreciated. Do you think that the partnership is somehow becoming unbalanced? Um, it's always been precarious. So people forget that in the 50s we had the McCarthy hearings. In the 60s we had the Vietnam War. Right? These are people who weren't alive during that period. Mm -hmm. Our country is always in some form of crisis. And the brilliance of America is that American, the American, the creativity and the entrepreneurial of the people gets through it. So the reason to, an to answer your question in a, in a strange way is to say, we're here because of the excellence of the quality of people and the educational systems and the motivations and the incentives. And that applies to the government and the universities and business. And yes, it's a mess. Now with respect to, to answer your question specifically, 
The problem with government is it's always behind, and it's designed to be that way. It's deliberative. It's supposed to take a while. If you want something done fast, do it in the private sector. The private sector will always operate quickly. The best model is as follows. The private sector has access to capital with risk and focus. I'm not talking about handouts. And the regulators are watching. And when something gets out of whack, which does occur, the regulator steps in at that point. That's called enlightened regulation. There's a tendency, I'll give you my favorite example. In AI, which is where I'm sending most of my work now, um, I was fortunate enough to leave the, lead the National Security Commission for AI for the government, the US government. And we produced a report, which I'm very proud of, the whole team. Europe built a report about regulation. They didn't have half the report being, what would it take to get the money and the people and the organization was we were focused. They just focused on regulation. So Europe will be an excellent regulator of stuff that they don't invent. Mm -hmm. The problem with regulation is the name is regulation. It should be invent and regulate. It should be promote and regulate. It should be economic development and jobs and regulation. Mm -hmm. If the regulator thinks their job is to regulate, then they will overregulate. These are complicated trade-offs. You can't get it perfect. There will always be, I'll give you an example, My favorite, another example. <clears throat> if I told you that self-driving cars could cut the number of deaths in the, in the US by half, you'd say that's great. There's on the order of 35,000 car deaths a year, so approximate. The number is increasing, by the way, unfortunately. And these are, cars are very safe. Let's say we could cut that by half. You'd say that's a pretty good idea. Those are lives, families, an enormous toll of car accidents. If, I don't know if you've had anyone die in a car accident. Yeah. It's horrific. Uh, one of my friends did. It's just terrible. Now go to a regulator and say, we're going to cut the deaths in half, and we want you to approve this new thing. They're not going to do it. They're going to say, I want you to cut all the deaths. And I say, I want to get to zero, but all I can get to is half right now. Is the regulator going to approve you? Not a chance. It's a case where you have a false trade-off. Mm. If the goal is to reduce deaths, just use deaths as because we all, that's obviously terrible. We're going to reduce deaths, then it's different from we want to eliminate them. Obviously, we want to eliminate them. The way we eliminate them is we reduce them. Mm. If you had a zero tolerance policy for deaths in test pilots, you'd never have airplanes. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, it's horrific, right? But they're doing something risky for our benefit and they're taking a risk. You have to figure out that balance. Yeah, I mean, I find that, always, uh, that example comes up quite a bit, the self-driving cars. I always find that interesting because I think the issue there is responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it's the perception of, like, yeah, you cut it in half, but who's now responsible for those, those, those deaths that remain? Well, I'll, 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 I'll give you my, my joke about this. So I don't know about you, but mm -hmm. when I drive in California, I have occasionally done that California rolling stop, you know, the kind of, uh -huh. you know, quite. So imagine you're in your self-driving car and it has learned from you to do this because it's a learning machine and the cop pulls you over and the cop says, um, sir, you know, you did a rolling stop. And I say, officer, I did not. And he said, the officer says, who did? And the car says, I did. Mm -hmm. And the officer says, why? And said, the car says, I don't know. We, a truthful yeah, everyone's yeah, tr yeah, everyone's yeah, being truthful yeah, yeah. in that scenario. Where's the liability? Now the officer is trying to do his job, his or her job, excuse me. I am being truthful. Mm -hmm. Is the car liable? Is the driver liable? Is the training liable? Is the manufacturer liable? We don't know. We have to figure these things out. But I'll tell you, the world will be safer with self-driving cars because self-driving cars don't get drunk, mm -hmm. right? A lot of accidents occur late at night, people are tired, whatever. They don't get tired, they don't get drunk, right? And it's criminal that we have all of these deaths today because we've not been able to find a path through this. No, I, I agree, and I think it ends. Up, a lot of it ends up being dealing with the liability issues. If if we got to, if we have the technology that's good enough, there's still going to be mistakes, and the liability issues are, are significant. And people, I think that people maybe don't trust that the corporations that will benefit financially will internalize the risks. There's a lot of distrust about corporations in this regard, and it's it's fine. This is the role for government. Mm -hmm. Corporate. I mean, everyone knows the story of, of mistreatment sitting in an airline seat. Mm -hmm. That's why the airline industry has a regulatory body, right? There's a passenger bill of rights. 
We have to find that balance. Those, and by the way, in the airline industry, these things are litigated forever. It's complicated. How many hours can you be held without water and food and so forth? And everyone's acutely aware of those rules. How long have we had these rules in place? You know, tens and tens of years, and we've worked them out. Mm -hmm. So I do want to come back to the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence sure. that you mentioned. Could you say a little bit about what, the, what was in the report, what the goals were? Well, we, we delivered our final report a little bit more than a, about a year and a half ago. And we worked on it for three years during the pandemic, which is very bizarre because we did it remotely. And the question was, is AI important from a national security perspective, and how are we doing? The rough summary is it's really important mm -hmm. because of the issues that you described. And we made a second set of recommendations. The first was more research money, which has occurred, thank mm -hmm. goodness. Mm -hmm. The second one was more collaboration with our domestic, our democratic partners, which is in the process of working on. Another one was very, very sophisticated training for government, which has not occurred yet, but is really important. Another one is to stay ahead of China with respect to semiconductors. Mm. We called in our report that we needed to stay two generations ahead of China in semiconductors. A generation is defined as a process cycle. And we said it would be really nice if they stayed at 14 nanometers, lower is better, and we would get to 5, 4, which is where we are now. It looks like China is now at the 7 nanometer, uh, seven, so they're, they're, they're already ahead of where we wanted to, which is not good. However, the recent actions by the Trump and Biden administration to limit access to what is called ultra uh, EUV technology, which is a very specialized product uh, that's handled by a specific company in uh, Netherlands called ASML, looks like it will hold them back. Mm. Um, and that'll be by us a year or two. The summary is, what we said is that the United States is ahead, that China is the primary competitor here, they're very smart and they're moving quickly and they're a short period of time behind us. Mm. We also in the report reported on some other things. We said that it looks like China is ahead of us in new energy. They make most of the batteries and so forth. It looks like China is ahead of, us, ahead of us in financial services. These are online banking, those kinds of things. These are very important. We know they're ahead of us in surveillance. And we also made a point that these new platforms that we're all building, AI-based, need to reflect American values. Mm. And when I talk about American values, I mean democratic values, the values of privacy, freedom, lack of surveillance, independence. It's easy for these technologies to be misused in a totalitarian state. And we expressly say that the technologies need to be developed in the context of American values. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And how do we ensure that? Because totalitarian states can misuse them, mm -hmm. but certainly so can democratic states and obviously private companies. So how do you... Um, think about the liability associated with the incredible power that might be unleashed by more sophisticated AI. Like, again, who's responsible for that? Um, I'll give you a, an example from a long time ago. One, an engineer came in and said, well, I figured out a way to predict where your friends will be and show you when you're going to meet. And I said, oh, my God, you're tracking everyone. <laughs> and, and at the time, Larry and Sergey were having fun with me, and they said, oh, that's a great idea. They were joking. And we eventually solved this problem by allowing you to misstate where you are, where you were. It allowed the system to be inaccurate with respect to something as sensitive as your location. Now, this is, again, a long time ago. But it's an example where if you phrase the question correctly, you can solve it. Private companies, in practice, do know where you are. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to say that the telephone company, because of 911, knows exactly where you are. But that information is highly regulated. And I think we'll say the same thing here. This is a case where things involving your person, your identity. Uh, another example is face recognition mm. is largely illegal in Europe and in a number of states in America it's illegal and as you know it's commonplace in China. Face recognition, very, very dangerous if misused for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Stalk, think about stalking alone. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I love the example of um, when they came to you and said, hey, we're going to give this, pro we're going to make this program. It's going to tell you where all your friends are and when you're going to meet. One, I love the story that you didn't want that to happen, like you're hiding from your friends. <laughs> but more, when you think about that going forward and what can be produced, I mean, you described it as you, you three in the room and figuring out how not for it to not be damaging. But what happens when that, that person is not in the room? What happens when this private company sees immense 
possibility financially in, in doing this. I guess, are we relying on the good intentions yeah. of private industry no. here? We're, 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 we're relying on the democratic system, regulation, and lawsuits. I can assure you that if somebody brought out a tool in America that had inside of it surveillance of the nature that you're describing, they would be sued to death. Mm -hmm. There is a great concern over Chinese products in America, which may or may not be doing that. And there's enormous concern, regulatory concern, political concern over mm -hmm. that. I don't know if it's true, but I think the good news about the concern you're at is it's a well-expressed one. Mm -hmm. I'm much more concerned about the ones that we don't know are coming. The, the, my favorite example with this is I did not understand, I, Eric, did not understand that the tribalism that occurs because of social media matching would become as powerful as it is. And I'm not making a political statement. This is true on the left and the right, mm -hmm. every race, every sex, every, every people. We're all at some level guilty of tribalism. Do you know why? It's in our nature as humans. We try to overcome it. I want to be a great American before I'm a great whatever I am. But I choose that, and I want that back. Mm. And I wonder if we're on our way back to that, and how do we get back there? Is it the, again, I'm, I'm, what I'm really so interested in in all these issues, all these topics, is the relative responsibility of private industry and the government and um, the power. It's not just responsibility, because we can say as a people the, pa the responsibility lies here or there, but where is the power lie? Who's making those decisions? Well, in our system, the companies have a lot of power, but the powerful companies have a lot of detractors and a lot of people looking at them. I was fortunate to work with two principled founders. We spent every day talking about these questions at the time as we worked it through, and I'm very, very proud of them for founding the company with those values. Now, you can debate them, but from my perspective, the values were set, and we had, we had a principle of do no evil. Mm -hmm. Now, there wasn't a book that said what evil was, but the principle allowed people to say, I think that's evil. I remember, I thought it was a joke, you know, marketing, you know, you know how companies are, they have <laughs> slogans. And I'm sitting in a room in the tiny little at the building when Google was founded. And this particular engineer, there was a proposal which at the time involved mis reusing the advertising money in a particular way, a small company. He pounds his table like this and he says, that's evil. And I go like, oh my God, <laughs> an evil, uh, you know, evil appearance. And then there was this food fight over was it evil or not, and he canceled the project. Mm -hmm. He managed to get it killed by his single pounding of the table. Mm -hmm. And I still remember it because it was true. So what I learned was when you get the right value system with really smart people, and the value system's important. Mm -hmm. So if you're run by a psychopath, I'm not alleging anyone's a psychopath, but if you're run by a psychopath who doesn't care, then bad stuff happens. Mm -hmm. But you need the right founders, and you need the right board, and you need the right regulatory structure to support it. Mm -hmm. I, and, I, and to be clear, there's this permanent now criticism of the tech, which I think is just industrial. I think they just raise money on it. And I think it's m misfounded. Um, there's a set of senators, for example, who are well known to be opposed to everything. Well, the fact of the matter is we are providing, as our industry, a great public service. Mm -hmm. My position is we welcome intelligent regulation, understand how we work, understand how the algorithms work, and help us do it the right way. Sure, there's stuff that you don't like on YouTube. Tell me how to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I, they get millions of videos a day, right? Show me how we don't have a way of doing human review. We don't know exactly how to build algorithms to fully detect it. The moment we notice it, we take it down. Do you have a better idea? That's the best we've come up with. The alternative is to shut down YouTube, which would be horrific mm -hmm. since YouTube is the primary tool for education and entertainment for most people in America. Mm -hmm. Well, given all that we discussed, this, my final question is, as you look into the future, what are your hopes and what are your fears? Well, I am more hopeful and more fearful than I have ever been. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm more hopeful for the following reason. <clears throat> I wrote a book with Dr. Kissinger on this called The Age of AI. And I'm more hopeful that these technologies in AI will bring out forms of intelligence which will advance sol solutions and cures to the things that have bedeviled humanity for generations. Cures for diseases that have been 
a, a good example I'm very proud of is AlphaFold, which was done by a subsidiary of Google called DeepMind, where 200 million of the proteins that exist in the world were mapped. This is a huge change in biology. It's a Nobel Prize, in my, opi in my opinion, mm -hmm. worthy achievement. I can give you example after example, the ability to educate every child wor in the world with good information. Think about all these people who are smart and hungry, mm -hmm. but they don't have what you and I have had, mm -hmm. right? All they have is a, a, dim a candle and some kind of dumb phone. Mm -hmm. But that's their hope. I'm so proud of that. I'm also, on the negative side, extraordinarily concerned about the change of perception and reality. From your birth, from my birth, we were taught as babies and growing up to believe our eyes and our ears. Mm -hmm. These systems will be able to create false realities. Those false realities could be manipulated for good. It could be, you know, Mother Teresa and Alfred, or it could be horrific, right? We have a choice on how those things emerge. We are still in charge. We have to be honest when you have bad, and it's a shock, but there's evil people in the world, and they invade countries, and they kill people, and so forth. If they get in charge of this technology, they can do a lot of damage. We have to responsibly discuss the dangers of these technologies, figure out ways cleverly to limit this impact while getting the extraordinary achievements in biology, chemistry, new materials, quantum theory, all of these things which will change the world so much more quickly than in my generation for you and your children and your grandchildren. Well, I hope, I hope it works out that way. Thank you. <laughs> but thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Okay. Really appreciate it. Much. We appreciate it. Um, so our conversation next time will be January 23rd. It'll air at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, and we'll continue our exploration of tech and government. Um, I'll be joined by Cade Crockford, Director of the Technology for Liberty Program at the ACLU, and Susie Allegra, legal data privacy expert and author of Freedom to Think, Protecting a Fundamental Human Right in the Digital Age. Thanks. <laughs>